let's go ahead and get started. Uh, people will sort of keep trickling in. Uh, so it gives me great pleasure to introduce uh, Santiago Torres Arias. Uh, he is a PhD candidate at New York University, uh, where he's done a lot of great work that's had a tremendous amount of industry impact, which I think he'll tell you about. Um, my one-line pitch on this is that you guys have all heard about securing the supply chain in a lot of different contexts, and Santiago likes to work on securing the software supply chain. Thank you. Um, yes, so I'm Santiago. I'm a PhD student at MOU, as you were told. Uh, I am from, or even from Mexico, uh, and I'm the talk that you're going to see today is pretty much uh, the story of how we, working with industry, we found this uh, very critical part of the security story. Uh, of software security story, and uh, we started tackling academic ways to fix the problem and eventually make it so that thousands of companies today are being secured using our system. Um, this is the type of work that I like to do. This is th the reason I wake up in the morning is not to write more papers, but rather find interesting academic contributions that can make people's lives better. Um, so to be a little bit more concrete, uh, this is the agenda that I'm going to, uh, that I'm going to cover. Uh, I'm going to, for those that are not familiar with the space of software supply chains, uh, software supply chain security, I'm going to talk about it. I'm going to cover the compromises. Uh, the work that I have to do actually had to uh, not only uh, fix the pro software supply chain security problem, but actually start measuring it. We have to understand what uh, were the compromises that happened the last in the last 10 years, and what were their impacts, and what mitigations could have helped, and what we could have done in order to protect that. That eventually culminated into a catalog that's uh, hosted by the Linux Foundation. That's uh, pretty much what people go look at uh, to get an idea of how software supply chain security compromises look like. Then I am going to cover a little bit about the work that I've done in the uh, scholarly uh, space to protect critical software, such as Git, uh, on the academic space to, to, to innovate ways that we can leverage classroom settings to fix things such as reproducible builds. And then uh, talk about the work that I've done in distribution platforms such as software systems. Uh, and then we're going to tie everything cryptographically together. At the end of the day, uh, software supply chain is a chain, and chains are made of links. So now that we have a bunch of strong links, we need to make them a chain. Then I'm going to talk a little bit about the ongoing work. Uh, now that we have Toto out there to protect the companies, what can we actually do uh, to think about the future and what the future threats are we going to be protecting? And then I'm going to cover a little bit more about the other work that I've done. So to make everything very uh, crisp for people that are, may not be working on uh, software even, uh, I like to use the metaphor of, of, of a bottle of Tylenol. Uh, a bottle of Tylenol went through what we call a supply chain. It was uh, made out of raw materials that were mined probably or were synthesized. They were eventually put into pills. The pills were put into bottles and the bottles were distributed into a pharmacy and then eventually they made it to the, the counter and into your home and you, then you take them when you have a headache. Now this is a security talk so it wouldn't be surprised uh, surprise to you that we talk about the software supply chain security, what things can go wrong in the software supply chain. So is anyone familiar with the Chicago Tylenol murders that actually happened close to here? Uh, for those of you that are not too familiar with this, uh, somebody walked into a uh, into a pharmacy, I think it was in 1982, there you go. Uh, 1982, somebody walks into a pharmacy, opens a bottle of Tylenol, puts cyanide on the bottles, then closes them back, put them back in the counter, and uh, it was a gruesome event. I think seven people died, some of them were children. It was a very, very sad moment. Um, but ever since, we have things that are actually silver lining in this whole story. That's uh, the, so the supply chain security aspect of a bottle of Tylenol. Yeah. In this bottle of Tylenol that you're looking at this, which is a bottle that I took off the internet, it's probably a recent bottle, you have things such as a lot number. A lot number is a, is a security feature in a bottle of Tylenol that will help you uh, work with recalls, right? It will help you take uh, things out of the counter if there's, if there's something that happened previously on the supply chain that made this uh, bottle a dangerous one. There's other things such as uh, an expiration date. An expiration date tells you that this is not a fresh product, that you shouldn't be consuming it. Maybe the materials in it, they're not trustworthy anymore. There's maybe a newer uh, thermal bottle that has a new FDA approved uh, process and that's the one that you should be consuming. And finally, the one that actually uh, came out of the Chicago Thermal murders is what, what's the temperature seal. 
that's the reason why when you see a bottle of juice or a bottle of pills that say don't open this, don't consume this if the tampon seal was broken. Now, all of this is a very known story of supply chain and this is the metaphor that I'd like to use to contextualize a little bit about the problem of software supply chain, which is we don't have anything like that. <laughs> or well, now we do, but we didn't uh, when I started my PhD. So we know and we're very familiar with what happens in a supply chain. We know uh, how a bottle of fentanyl was made. We know how, uh, how it's protected. We know what to check for in order to ensure that this bottle of fentanyl is, uh, is trustworthy. Now, you may be wondering what goes in a software supply chain. Uh, here is a very cartoonish, very simplistic, uh, what I call the GitHub generation type of software supply chain. You probably have some code, you put it in a version control system repository. If you're feeling fancy, you probably put it on a CI CD system that's constantly running tests and it's very fine that the build is passing and it, uh, it conforms to certain quality criteria. You probably build it in your laptop or in a build farm and then it eventually is put in a package in the same way that a time of bottle is put and then it's shipped off to users and users consume the software and then they use the software. So again this is a security talk so you wouldn't be surprised if I told you that bad things can happen in the software supply chain. There's things that can happen in the version control system. This is uh, a little bit of a glimpse into the exploration that we did uh, on the this software supply chain catalog. Uh, attackers can break into the version control system of, for example the Juniper firewall uh, vendor and they can flip the pseudo random seed of a uh, sort of random generator in such a way that if you knew this particular change was made, you can decrypt every single IPsec connection that was done to every single uh, Juniper firewall that was shipped during this, uh, during these times. Think about the impact, think about the blast radius of a compromise like this. Once the random C compromised, everybody is affected. And this is of course not an isolated incident in the, in the world of version control system compromises. There's compromises that can happen in the build, in the build system. There's, uh, of course, the uh, Bitcoin compiler story. One that's really realistic is the uh, Xcode ghost compromise, where somebody bre breaks into a, well, not breaks into, distributes a compromised version of Xcode in such a way that, uh, that it introduces a, a backdoor in the iOS apps that were compiled using this tool chip. The result is uh, very popular applications such as Angry Birds were compromised and then they were shipped to users. Uh, you may be guessing, we're good at interpolating and engineering. This is not an isolated incident. Things can also happen in the distribution mechanism. The bad things can happen such as malicious mirrors, uh, package compromises, uh, broad uh, packagers. This is uh, also a stage in which I usually like to explain uh, how it, it can also allow for people to target certain populations. Uh, this is a case of a PHP MyAdmin uh, package that was compromised and it was compromised only in the South Korean server. Uh, this means that some, maybe somebody with political reasons or political motivation was uh, behind certain group. Uh, it is not a surprise that there's also cases in which uh, Microsoft certificates for uh, Windows drivers for Farsi language packs have been also compromised. It gives you that political uh, angle of what things can happen and how they can go wrong and how you can actually be a little bit creative and attack a certain uh, group of people just by compromising the software supply chain. Of course, this is not an isolated incident. We've been seeing this uh, in the news for the last 10 years going on and on and on. Finally, there's also cases of compliance in which uh, there were compromised, well, in theory, compromises in Windows uh, there was a malicious uh, or a malfunctioning update that was released of Microsoft Windows that essentially bricked everybody's computer, everybody who updated at that time. At some point, uh, at that time, there was a lot of finger pointing going around and telling, hey, uh, there may, somebody may have broken into Windows infrastructure. It turns out that it was just lack of compliance. Somehow, through the pipes, this Windows update made it out to the users and caused devastating damage. This is, of course, not an isolated incident. Uh, this happened as well to the Linux kernel. And the state of affairs is high. I'm going to stop here for a second. Uh, even in a cartoonish software supply chain, in, 
when I started this talk, I was saying, well, this is the GitHub generation, but it's very simple. Probably your students are doing it. It's, everything's OK. Nothing's going wrong. Uh, I'd wager that there's eight devils, and six of them, a compromise means a complete subversion of the resulting package. It means uh, another Chicago type converter. And as, as we've seen before, it has been happening on and on and on and on for the last 10 years or more. Um, the stakes are high. Uh, it is it's actually a very impactful uh, compromise. It is so impactful that even on the two months ago by now, there was a, there was a congressional hearing about the uh, voting machines and their software and how their software supply or well, the supply chain as a broader concept was uh, was had a uh, had a say in the picture. There's uh, academics that you may know, like Matt Lay is going like, this is actually something that we should be thinking about. This is something that we should be reasoning about. So I already did my homework. I hope I scared you all. Uh, <laughs> this is just the beginning of the talk. I am going to tell you how we're going to fix all of this. So on the testing part of this, uh, you know, the example seem mostly to be about kind of mistakes that are happening as opposed to malicious actors. Is, is there it, a vector for malicious actors? On the yes, that's a, so that's, that's also part of what makes it uh, complicated because sometimes it can be malicious. Sometimes it can be a malicious backer. Sometimes it can be a lack of compliance. Sometimes it can be just a wrong actor that you trusted originally. And as we'll see later down the line, it is part of what drives a design. You need to be able to pretty much counteract all of these three different things that keep happening and take this security degraded system and bootstrap it back up into something that you can trust again. But first, uh, we're going to look at it from a little bit on the top. Um, to fix this, we need to do two things. As I already said, this is a chain, this is a software supply chain, so the first thing we need to do is build strong links, and then we need to build a chain out of those links. So this is the same software supply chain that we looked at, and I picked it not only because it was simple, it really does uh, show you the scope of the problem, it also lets us explore how, what we can do as uh, faculty in a university in order to fix this problem, and it's not only writing papers, we can do many other things. Uh, the first one, of course, is you can actually write papers. Uh, you can <laughs> identify uh, design issues on a popular system, such as uh, Git, that lets you uh, change the state of a version control system, uh, even if uh, signing is done, even if uh, a security uh, mechanism such as commit signing is done, you can still tamper with the metadata of it, and that yields the link itself. Uh, not trustworthy. This is a paper that I wrote in Unix Security 2016. You could basically trick uh, developers into installing the wrong package just by tampering with the tag metadata. Or you can uh, you could trick people into merging the wrong things uh, just by tampering with the branch metadata. And uh, well, this is pretty much what set off the push certificate solution. Uh, if you're using Git 2.9, again, I am really driven by practical impact. Uh, you're probably using Git 2.9. It's been uh, four years now, so you, uh, you're secure. You're running my code, and this is something that made me wake up in the morning. Uh, this also led to other people consider this uh, type of uh, attack uh, avenues. Uh, Arch Linux right now is checking uh, very stringently the tag metadata, not only the signatures over the tags of the releases, but the tag metadata itself. And it has also led to other projects, such as the Tor project, to consider uh, this avenue of attack and uh, start integrating them into their build pipelines. Now, this is the easy answer. This is what usually gives you the. Uh, so take our file about the threat modules. So where are the attackers? Um, where do they come from? What is their capability? Yes. Uh, so on the threat model of the, on this Git attacks paper, it pretty much assumed either a man in the middle on the communication between uh, the client and the server or a compromised server. We found that, the, as, as we saw earlier on, it, it was a pretty common threat model. There's uh, there's two big profile attacks on that case. One of them is uh, somebody hacked into the uh, account of the developer of requests, Python requests, which is uh, pretty much if you're doing HTTP requests using Python, you're using that library. Um, it went over, it went through 2FA, it went through a bunch of things, and it also tampered with the metadata. Well, it tampered with the releases. There's uh, then there's this other big profile. Uh, man-in-the-middle attack that China did on GitHub uh, that's also very 
there's there's a lot of uh, nebulous uh, stories going on in there. A lot of people point fingers. Uh, everybody says that maybe China didn't do it. Maybe we'll never know. But we know is that there for a brief period of time there was a man in the middle of a connection between Git, well GitHub, and a client. And uh, these attacks were actually very small in uh, complexity. Uh, tampering the tag metadata, for example, was you basically reuse an existing tag pointer from an old release and you point it to a new one. And then a client will download it that will say, this is a tag, this is signed by the right person, but it will still be tricked into installing the wrong thing. So it, it is a little, I would even say it's a little silly. Uh, we ended up developing a, what we, what's called a certificate, uh, no, a reference state log, which eventually ended up similar, being similar to a transparency log in which you can get a snapshot of the metadata state, of the repository state, and you have a little bit of, uh, you have mechanisms such as, uh, the word is coming to, the word pollution is coming, but it's the opposite of pollution. <laughs> uh, you have uh, you have mechanisms to make sure that all of the parties are pushing and the state of the repository is being updated in consistent ways. Uh, that way you can ensure that the facts that tamper with metadata and get are not, uh, no, are not successful. Going back to going back to this, there's other times in which you cannot do exactly scholarly work or scholarly work is done, but state of affairs is still uh, not entirely great. In the case of reproducible bills, for example, uh, which is uh, a security, well, not a security mechanism, but it's a precondition that we need to make in order to make it, uh, educated decisions about build system security. If uh, builds are not deterministic, then you can't trust them. In that case, well, I had to fly all the way to Redmond. I had to convince them to uh, set up our builder in such a way that Debian and Microsoft were all building uh, the same software and agreeing on the software. Uh, that was not enough. I also uh, had to refactor a bunch of the code base of, uh, of the reproducible builds tool chain. Uh, I also had to find uh, bugs in uh, popular, well, not popular, uh, pieces of software such as GNU APL. Uh, and then from all of this experience that I had, um, I ended up building a course. I built a course in which students were able to identify um, reproducibility issues of uh, popular software. They were able to get themselves acquainted with the security properties, of the security relevance of reproducible builds, with uh, how software is built uh, today. And they were able to interact with uh, a lot of open source communities out there so in, in such a way that they, they really loved what's going on. Uh, there were 55 tags and issues on Debian and Arch Linux that they identified, uh, bugs that were actually recognized by the community. Then 18 of them were able to write a patch that fixes that bug, and out of them, four were merged. Some others were merged after the fact. It was a little bit tricky to grade, but it was actually an amazing experience because, well, we had real world impact. Students were able to go out there and get themselves appointed how to make uh, things better. And the third case that I'd like to bring up is uh, when you can make both things come out together. Um, you not only need to uh, find a problem with a popular tool, you need to do a scholarly work and build a system. And that's the case of uh, Diplomat. Diplomat is a software update system that's uh, based off of uh, Tuff. It is, uh, it is a system that also assumes that the software repository will be compromised and uh, there's going to be uh, somebody delivering malicious payloads or replaying all payloads or trying to attack the client in such a way that it crashes by sending like massive amounts of data. It is actually hilarious that a bunch of uh, pieces of software out there weren't checking for things like this. So we make this work. We then eventually try to standardize. Uh, this is the image of the standardization process for PEF 458. This is the Python enhancement protocol. Uh, which was just approved uh, a month ago. You will be using tough in when you're using pip without knowing. And this is just the case of Python. You, uh, you are probably using uh, tough and diplomat if you're using Docker Content Trust. You are probably using uh, Flynn or VMware and DigitalOcean. DigitalOcean was actually a little funny because uh, we found that they were running our software because we made a typo on the, lo on the log statement. And they were grabbing for it to, uh, <laughs> and we found it. And it's like, oh, this is not even coming from our installation. It's some other installation, and this is the DigitalOcean droplet. Uh, 
I'm also very proud that uh, I was able to work with the Cloud Native Computing Foundation, which is part of the Linux Foundation, uh, with part of the Linux Foundation that focuses on Cloud Native Ecosystems. And Tuff was finally graduated, uh, I think, in December last year. This is the highest uh, like honor that they can give to a project, and it's, I think, the only academic project that has ever graduated from a Linux Foundation community. So, well, we did a lot of fixing. We did the uh, scholarly work. We did the uh, course building. We found ways to uh, leverage all of our resources as academics in order to protect the software supply chain. And uh, I took the liberty of removing a couple of devils. Uh, there's still connections uh, between uh, steps. And even then, we still have three points, maybe four, in which I wager that a compromise will be complete subversion of the software supply chain, which uh, takes us to the meat of, uh, of the talk. This is where uh, we are really going to think about in total, in total as a system. So the realization that we came to, and that's the reason why it exists, is that you cannot just go uh, uh, around and start trying to fix individual links and then uh, think of security on software supply chain as some sort of emergent property. But rather, you need to fix the supply chain as a whole. Uh, in total itself uh, is Latin for as a whole. That's where it all came from. Um, so, in order to do this, uh, we sat back and it took us a couple of years to identify uh, the design properties of a system that was able to not only protect the software supply chain as a whole, but also uh, be able to protect any supply chain. Uh, and was able to not only protect any supply chain, but again, it was able to protect any supply chain about this plethora of attacks that we found. Uh, just for, um, for the record, I think we're, we're shy of 60 attacks now in this uh, catalog. Uh, that are being contributed by community members of all walks of life. And, uh, but anyway, we came to this, uh, this three conditions, this uh, three important aspects that uh, we need to consider. One of them is compromise resilience, and compromise resilience pretty much means we will make the assumption that nodes will be compromised. There's going to be rough actors at points, there's going to be lack of compliance at other points, and we need to be able to take on from that degraded state back into a fully trusted system. The other one is uh, something that's all encompassing. Uh, it can go all the way right and all the way left in this diagram that we had. We need to go, and I'll explain a little bit more about that later, we need to go from the version control system on whatever happens before if we need to, and uh, from the distribution mechanism on whatever will happen afterwards. Uh, as a consequence of this, we'll get to the last uh, property, which is expressiveness. We, uh, we took a while to find enough practical deployments uh, and enough counter, counter examples in the wild that we, uh, to ensure that our system was actually being usable by everybody out there. I'm going to elaborate on, the, on these principles a little bit later. Uh, uh, now, so when I talk about the compromised resilience, I pretty much distinguish them with role separation and uh, uh, key revocation and key rotation. Uh, on the case of, uh, of the supply chain that we had before, one immediate uh, intuition that we can have is, well, we can just distribute trust to the, to the people that are acting on there. And uh, we'll ask them to only perform the minimum amount of duties and, uh, and not let them partake in any other operation. That uh, limits trust and that reduces the possibility of compromise. The second obvious consequence is that, well, we may have uh, compromised uh, actors such as they in the testing, we need to. We are still able to make uh, a strong security story about what's the critical, what's on the critical path, uh, what happens to the no nodes that we still trust, and we also want to have uh, key rotation and key uh, and uh, key revocation as first class triggers. So we don't trust uh, Dave anymore. We want to be able to say, Hey, Ada, I really, I trust you more than Dave. Can you please come in? Uh, I'll give you a key, and we are, are going to bootstrap from the existing system into a system that still uh, that now trusts Ada and not Dave anymore. That is role separation. That's uh, key rotation. So, in the presence of a, I have a couple questions about the compromise. Sure. So, in the presence of a compromised node, what are the guarantees you're providing? Are you, are you basically just guaranteed that you'll detect that the compromise existed, and so you, nobody will sort of be able to like install incorrect software, or are you actually resilient and that you'll still produce correct software? Well. It depends on the compromise itself. We're, um, 
when we get to the security properties, uh, we'll talk a little bit more about that. But uh, it will be able to detect, it will be able to stop an installation if there was a tampering going on. Uh, there is a uh, there's possibility for future work to make dedicated decisions. In the case that I was showing, well, the test on pass, but if everything is correct, then you can probably say, hey, everything's okay, let's just try, see what happens. Uh, there's other ways to float the, the errors. If we get to a demo, depending on how we're doing in time, <laughs> uh, you will see that uh, this demo will actually be working on the Debian app uh, system. You will probably be able to use it very soon. If you're, you're, well, if you're running Debian testing, you're able to use it. But you're probably not running Debian testing. Uh, but it's pretty much that. It will float an error and it will say like something happened and the default in the app package managers actually tells you why don't you try with, with fix missing, which actually has nothing to do. It's just that the error floating is not as uh, granular as one would hope and expect. This is, again is an engineering issue, but it's also something that we should be considering when we're designing systems like this. Um, but in general, just assume that if uh, there's any lack of trust or there's an attestation that you don't, that you don't trust, we'll get to attestations in, in a minute, you should stop the installation. And that's probably the best case. <laughs> So that's a role separation and compromise resilience. Uh, what I mean to tool agnostic is uh, I am a open source developer. I work with many open source communities. And uh, I know that 90% of the people use Git. But uh, I know that other uh, projects, such as Neomod, the metal client that I use, they actually use uh, Mercurial, which is another version control system. Uh, we need to design a system that is not uh, <coughs> morphed or defined by the idiosyncrasies of the tools themselves. We need to design a system that's actually all encompassing and doesn't consider uh, the concept of a branch as it comes from Git. If you actually take a look at how Mercurial is designed, a branch is more like a book bookmark, it's more like a tag, but they use the word branch. Um, and you need to uh, propagate this type of attitude to all of the stages in the software supply chain. When you make this decision, then you get to a system that's also all-encompassing. And uh, when I say all-encompassing, I mean that the software supply chain of today, the example that we're using, the cartoonish example of today, will be a little bit crazier tomorrow. It will have probably things branching out of packaging. Actually, this is not too weird. Uh, if you want an example of that, uh, in the cloud native ecosystems, a vulnerability scan is something that actually branches out of the packaging step. Uh, and you can have things that may happen before the code compliance, uh, maybe uh, static analysis, and actually let's try with a, uh, with a crazy example. Say that uh, Charlie who <laughs> comes and says, well, I designed a system in which everybody that's typing will have their fingerprint read and it, it, it will check that every single keystroke was typed by the right person. <laughs> well, we want to be able to put that into the system. We want to be able to protect and make sure that this integrity uh, flow is public. And uh, let's go a little bit crazier and say that sometime in uh, using 2021, somebody comes with a hypnotic, a hypnotic attack in such a way that people are hypnotized into typing <laughs> weird things into their, uh, into their development environments and create backdoors for software. So say that uh, Sarab comes <laughs> in and he's like, well, actually, we're going to put a hat on everybody and check for alpha waves in such a way that we're able to tell the intent of people and make sure that they're not hypnotized. Well, we want to make sure that that's actually also part of the whole chain. We want to be able to verify that the, this compliance on, this, on a system like this is followed. So that's what I mean when I say uh, all-encompassing. With a system like this, then you end up with something very expressive, something that actually lets you explore the zoo of software supply chains that exists out there. You have things such as the Debian packaging uh, world in which you have an upstream, you have a patching downstream, and you have a packaging system that takes both together and then does like some weird thing and spits out the Debian package. You have cases in which you have <coughs> different accepting states, such as the GCC story in which you have a subversion version control system that uh, sends everything to a build bot instance, but you can also check out the tar, uh, the tar bot yourself. You have cases such as Django, which is packaged uh, in a very Debian way. You have a version control system that it eventually makes into a bunch of shell scripts that uh, update everything, and then it eventually makes it to PyPI. And uh, I put an arrow here because if you are probably making a container or an ISO image, you will probably pull this package into your supply chain. 
So you want to uh, you end up with a system that lets you represent all of this. Uh, if you're wondering, uh, there's the case of Datadog. Well, this is the practical deployment that we'll explore a little bit on the evaluation. I probably need to hurry. Uh, but uh, that is a very cool one because you're able to authenticate every single developer uh, action using a hardware token and Unity keys all the way uh, in the New York Times building in New York, that's where the office of Datadog are, uh, before you install any single package of the Datadog ecosystem. So how do we do this? I already said what we want to do. We made a lot of exploratory analysis. Uh, now we'll come to how do we actually do it. And it, com it turns out it's pretty simple, but it, that's a, that's what we were aiming for, something that was simple enough that let us do all, all of these things. So the goals are, we want to very finely define what are the steps in the software supply chain. We want to say there's a virtual control system, there's a build system, there's a packaging ecosystem, there's a testing infrastructure. We also want to very finely define who is going to partake in these activities. We want to provide it, and then we finally want to tie, every, tie everything together. We want to create a chain. So to do this, uh, we will need two pieces of information. The first one is uh, what we call an total layout. It's a piece of metadata that is pretty much like a recipe. Inside of it, you will find a field called steps. I am pointing out the most important field. There's other interesting things going on there. But uh, the steps pretty much says, what I already said. There's a version control system, there's a build, uh, there's a build farm, there's a testing infrastructure, there's a packaging output system. Then it will assign functionaries and their public keys to each of these steps. We have Bob, the not builder, but we have Carl, the builder, and uh, we have Dave, the tester, and Aaron, the packager. Then it will finally register what we call their artifacts, what materials and products, which is what they uh, consume and what they produce. It can be source code, uh, it can be images, it can be container images, it can be, uh, it can be a result of a vulnerability analysis, it can be anything you can think of. And it will use a domain specific language to tie everything together. It will say Carol will consume the sources uh, in to build and it will produce a binary that will be used by Erin in the packaging system. And finally, we will root trust over this file with a, what we call the project owner. The project owner signs this file with a hard private key. Uh, and so we know that they are actually the ones that are providing this set of rules. With this, we know what needs to happen. This is a, a terse description of what needs to happen in this software supply chain. Now, uh, we need to know what happened. And for that, we are going to use this other piece of total metadata. That's called a link. We create a, a series of runtime tools. There's pretty much uh, everything you may need in order to track the actions of a host and produce a signed attestation. It's pretty much a rubber stamp that says, this is what I took in, this is what I spit out, this is some information about the environment, and here's a cryptographic signature to rubber stamp everything together, and then we're going to send everything out. With these attestations, we are able to build something we call the deliberate product, or the final product. Final product will be what is usually considered a final product, say a Debian package, this layout policy, and a bunch of attestations. With this bunch of attestations, we're able to turn uh, the question of software supply chain integrity into a question of authenticating every single piece of uh, information. Does everything come from the right party? And then we turn everything into a question of graph isomorphism. That is, is this uh, layout are described as a graph of actors and flow of artifacts, does it match what the attestations have? And if that's correct, then we can say that everything is correct. Now, uh, any questions so far? So these, these layouts are, so they're, they're package specific. Are the actors in these layouts uh, for enterprise, or are they sort of concrete actors? Like, it um, has to be some Debian guy that's the packager. Uh, versus so they are, so there's three, levels of answer here. Uh, they can be very, very terse. Like, it goes all the way to a public key that says, this is the, this public key corresponds to this step. And then there's a bunch of rules for that specific. So whoever step. has the private key associated with the public key gets to do this. Right. Uh, the, whoever owns this private key can create the stations for this and can say whatever happened. Now, uh, layouts are also recursive. So you can say, you can delegate trust that way. You can say, well, 
I don't know what's going to happen in this whole ecosystem of a very convoluted supply chain, but I know that the person X is going to tell you what happened there or what needs to happen. And this is also very important for open source consumption. This part of the reason why Microsoft really likes this because you can pretty much turn the creation of an, an installable image into a like very high fan in uh, graph. And uh, the other one is there's a there's an extension to Intoto that uses parameter substitution and uh, actual parameters in such a way that at runtime you can say, well, I figured out by a side channel that this is the right answer. Now that's a whole can of worms that uh, it gets a little bit too like engineering, like let's make production ready type of systems, but uh, that's not going to cover, be covered here. But, uh, but yeah, you can parameterize that. Um, I'm going to go into the security analysis. Uh, we're going to do a two-pronged approach. Uh, the attacker motivations, uh, I pretty, pretty much wanted to put this uh, on the table, is they want to do anything from stealing things, to causing damage, to using your computing resources, to target a competitor. We say this because this has happened, so uh, we know that the attackers, there's attackers out there trying to do this. Now, the scarier part of this is what the attacker can do to do this. Uh, an attacker can actually do anything as well. They can uh, compromise core infrastructure, sort of, such as version control systems the, or build farms, as they've done before. They can compromise the communications from them, or they can even compromise keys uh, of the people that are actually performing the actions or compel them to do things, such as uh, the work that we did with Git, uh, in such a way that they will produce the wrong output. Um, what we do assume, and I think this is like boilerplate for a security conference uh, talk, is we don't assume that they are able to break into public key proof systems or like uh, break some hashes with like a hash algorithm or such. I'm going to ignore uh, the key case, the compromising a key for a second, just so we can check the correctness of the system in like a sunny uh, day type of thing, and then we're going to get into the into the degrading of the security story, which is also part of what makes the system interesting. Um, so just to walk through everything, uh, let's assume that an attacker is able to compromise the communications and uh, the nodes with not the keys. If an attacker can do so, they cannot redefine the policy. The policy is signed by a key that we trust, and we can root to trust from there. This lets us uh, identify the actions that can be done. This means that an attacker cannot do anything else. They cannot take the sources here and write something else and then pass it forward. This means that uh, the attacker cannot also, if he cannot create or remove actions, he can, he can also, he cannot do uh, an action on behalf of a user because he doesn't control the private key to do that action. Uh, and finally, even though he would be able to tamper with a, uh, with the artifacts on the fly, they will be connected using pretty much hash chaining, so we are able to tell that it has been tampered on the fly. Now that's the nice story. That's the, like, pretty much anybody can come up with a system like this. <laughs> now, things get a little bit more interesting when we assume that attackers are able to actually break into the system and, uh, and create different types of habits. We see that there's three cases. One of them is less than a threshold of keys. That means we're back to step zero. Uh, functionary key compromise. This means the keys that are usually put on the left, not the, the key on the layout. This will have a, a very interesting uh, taxonomy of attacks that I'm going to talk a little bit about later. And finally, more uh, than a threshold of them, which uh, will also, uh, this is pretty much game over. We're back to step two, not having any total in place. So to focus on the second one, uh, we came up with a taxonomy that pretty much uh, covers all of the cases. Uh, one of them is fake check. This is, for example, what you were saying of, well, I control the key of a CI system that's constantly checking for things. I am able to say things are okay, but I'm not able to produce any type of artifact that's consumed by anybody else. In that case, well, you will also, you won't be able to do sort of a anything more than break compliance uh, stories. There's uh, product notification, which is an interesting, like a real interesting case in which you're able to, for example, break into a build farm. And in that case, if you control a threshold of keys in a build farm, 
you will be able to modify a build if there's something built. And uh, there's some intended retention where you are supposed to be deleting something from the pipeline, but you let it slip. And finally, arbitrary supply chain control. You are able to define the supply chain by controlling a full layout. Uh, this is a table taken from the Unix Security 2019 paper. You pretty much, it pretty much boils down to, to make the story short. If, uh, if there's two steps that are interacting with each other, and you compromise one of the keys of the step that's providing artifacts to the next one, and the rules themselves allow you to create, to, for example, allow create or modify a pattern that's then used afterwards, then you're, you have a product modification in your hands. In this case, uh, there's sort of things that you can do within the system to raise the bar. You can use uh, threshold signing. You can have many people building the same thing and then using a consensus protocol. That's what I was looking for in order to make sure uh, that everything is, uh, that, that none of, like, not all of the servers were compromised. Now, this is, uh, for the interest of time, this is pretty much what I have for the security. There's, uh, there's a lot of uh, exploration on how this, uh, interacts with the compromises that we were exploring earlier, but uh, well the interesting part for me is the integrations. This is the, probably you have in total secured pipelines in your phone right now, and that's what makes me very excited about things. In total has been used by thousands of companies and open source projects, and uh, even banks that don't let us uh, say that they're using in total. <laughs> but, uh, but that let us uh, explore a, look, uh, a lot about the software supply chain uh, cases, and actually that's how we're going to get the evaluation. For the sake of uh, the evaluation, I'm going to talk about the Datadog story. Uh, Datadog is the one that for provides all of the uh, all of the metrics <coughs> and the monitoring system for all of the companies that you see on the right. That is, if uh, these companies are running Datadog code in their infrastructure, uh, how are they doing that? Well. For the cloud people, they may, they may be familiar, but for people that are not uh, too cloud uh, native, <laughs> um, Datadog installs what they call a Datadog agent on every, every single node of uh, the consumer's cloud. That is, it is an a, a piece of code running as root that, um, that is translating the workload into something that can be visible by, by the monitoring system. To do so, uh, there's what are called integrations, and they are pieces of code that are translation layers that run in the agent uh, namespace, um, and they translate the workload. For example, a MySQL uh, node will have a MySQL integration that will be analyzing how the MySQL server is running and then send the metrics back to the, back to the server so you can actually check how things are running. Um, Datadog uses this software supply chain. It's highly linear. They built, they wrote a blog post about it. They called it a tamper or tamper-proof evident uh, or end-to-end -end, uh, verifiable CI/CD system. Every time a developer on the New York Times New York Times building changes a piece of code, he has to touch a Yubi key, and that sets up a whole chain of uh, events that starts creating attestations, and these attestations eventually end it. The agent verifying that everything came from the right place. Uh, this actually is very cool that can detect things such as zip bombs and uh, this whole uh, class of attacks on uh, compressor, compression algorithms because a simple check like saying, is what I took out the same as what was put into the zip file? Uh, so native to this system that you can actually detect when somebody is able to try to break into the zip, uh, into the zip uh, compression system. Um, so with this, we found a bunch of data from all of these deployments. We explored how uh, all of these attacks, back then it was 23, uh, there's way more happening right now, how that would have affected uh, the, eco uh, the ecosystem. We found that in most cases, when you have uh, the right policies in place and you're very, very stringent about things, you will be able to protect that uh, against most of them. We were also able to measure how much does it really cost uh, there's a bunch of uh, uh, there's a bunch of uh, packages that we measured how much how big they are and compare them with the metadata um, size. You see that there's a very bad case on the right. I'll talk about uh, about it in a minute. I think I only have time though. <laughs> but uh, but it pretty much scales with the number of files of package. The reason why this one is so big 
uh, is because Cisco API ships a little piece of code for every single uh, chip that they have ever made, and this uh, this makes and it's a lot of test code that makes uh, this package in particular an outlier and a, a very costly one at that. To include, sorry, real quick question. You, you said really costly, but you're, you said this is like ten kilobytes, fifteen kilobytes. And that seems totally reasonable, right? For yes. For uh, so what is your metric for like what is too much metadata? Well, well so also. Something I'll say uh, happened after, after the fact. All of these test assets can also be filtered out, and you can reduce the size. Uh, when I said this, uh, it was not able, like, on cloud systems, especially there's a there's a concept of admission, uh, admission control, which is when it, when something is about to be deployed in the cloud, I'm going to check for its correctness. Uh, when I say it's just a couple of kilobytes, it's the whole check was consuming data from other sources, and it was actually fetching a container image that was a bunch of megabytes sometimes. So it was pretty much negligible. Uh, it was not noticeable by the users, mostly. Uh, today they have the option of turning it off. We haven't seen them do that. I guess what I was saying is sort of in the other direction, like even your bad case, even 20 kilobytes, like that doesn't seem like a big deal. Yeah, it's, it's pretty much, it's pretty, <laughs> we were worried about it because there's also like very high latency uh, cases uh, and for completeness, we actually plotted it and explored how much it costs. It's not for, it's not free. This is the real world. <laughs> Things are not for free. But uh, we really wanted to uh, to be able to tell how much it really costs. Uh, that's why. So to include, uh, in total, it's a novel supply chain security framework, pretty much the first one that provides cryptographic uh, guarantees and full encompassing, and uh, it. It is usable by thousands of companies. Uh, it is also, uh, well, another reason that I'm so proud of it is uh, I built a community around it. It took me many years to get people from industry and from open source, from pretty much all walks of life to start contributing to it. Uh, you can see a talk about Intel on KubeCon EU. That's the biggest open source conference uh, in the world. Uh, you can also check this URL, so I'll share the slides. You will see people from VMware, IBM, Google, Microsoft, all of them are contributing code because they happen to be running it, so they don't want to use it. Uh, and that's part of the success story of the system these days. Um, that's also part of the reason why Toto now is, uh, as this, its sister project top, part of the Cloud Native Computing Foundation, that means it has a home that may, will make sure that the system will not just be a zip file in some academics, uh, Website, but rather a system that's, uh, that has many stakeholders that are making sure that it's going to grow healthily and will be part of the internet uh, infrastructure. So that is it for now. I have um, eight minutes to go. I will go through a little bit of what happens now. We have a Intoto out there. There's a bunch of questions. I'll rush through it, uh, but please stop me and we can go back to them. So a thing that we usually joke with when we talk about Toto in, in this community is, is that it's insecure totals all the way down. What I mean with this is that even though you can authenticate the host, there's a bunch of things on the software stack of every single one of these nodes that we don't know about, we don't have any transparency of, and we actually may not even trust. So in the case of, for example, X Xcode Ghost, we got a counterfeit tool chain, and uh, we could have prevented that attack if this tool chain was itself verifiable. But there's also the fact that we can use existing, uh, syst well, not system, existing uh, mechanisms such as the TPM and Measure Boot to create what uh, I'm calling a hardware powered supply chain layer at station. You can use uh, a TPM to authenticate every single piece of uh, the supply chain as it's starting to be pulled into the system. You can authenticate by the firmware, you can authenticate the bootloader and extend to it to the PCR that created the previous uh, element. And then you can authenticate the kernel, and then you can continue going up, and then you have a very strong security story about ev where every single bit of, uh, of this computer came from, uh, from every single developer that contributed to it. Again, this is a very um, practice-oriented uh, type of work. What we're uh, working on is into integrating this into Zephyr. Zephyr project is a real-time operating system kernel that is being used by itself, the Yocto project. The Yocto project is a real-time operating system for mission-critical systems, as mission-critical as the International Space Station. Uh, that is uh, what I really want us to 
put the system in, and uh, in the same way that we did it with Datadog, they want us to do the evaluation on something like this. This is a cheap joke, but uh, I needed to do it. Some people say it's a moonshot. I say it's a little bit lower than that, <laughs> but, uh, but okay. Now, that is one piece of work. Second work, second one is uh, we're looking down. We can, we can also look up. We can look about how software is consumed. This is a very attractive uh, aspect of, uh, of Intoto for industry. They are building systems out of open source, and they actually have no transparency on how things uh, are made. Uh, we actually found out that uh, in many cases, they don't have uh, any visibility on two or three layers uh, down on their dependency chains. And not only on the dependency chains of runtime, but dependency chains on the build system. So me and a student, a master student of mine, uh, effectively, uh, I effectively uh, supervised this. Uh, his thesis, we uh, took the question of uh, left pad. If anybody's familiar with left pad, uh, left pad was uh, a package in the NPM ecosystem. Somebody pulled it, and it broke a bunch of people's, uh, a bunch of people's software, because they were depending on it. Uh, and they were just assuming that it was going to be there forever. That was not the case. So uh, we set off to build what we call the left pad index. How much of your system is, uh, or the critical infrastructure, is depending on this very critical dependency. Uh, we built a tool chain to run dependency analysis on different uh, data sets. This is, for example, the Arch Linux uh, data set, which is one that was very accessible to us. Uh, we have done it with other ones. You can see that it's pretty much a Impossible to scramble. Uh, we built an algorithm. Um, we're going to change the name. I think that's a pretty bad name. Uh, but it's page ranky type. Uh, it is able to identify and answer the question if I really wanted to compromise everybody's supply chain, which package would I compromise? And it takes into account things such as the jurisdiction of the source, the author, are they following the right security practices, and so on and so forth. Um, Again, this is practical impact oriented. We were hoping to turn this into the scheduler algorithm of the Rebuilder constellation in such a way that you can build the things that are more critical first, so you can have more availability of the different attestations. And then moving forward this, um, we can also use uh, auditable data structures. I don't know if people are familiar with transparency laws or transparency maps. They're basically data structures that you can follow their evolution and you have a cryptographically verifiable paper trail of how things ha uh, change through time. This is the technology behind transparency, uh, certificate transparency. And uh, that is something that you can use with the Intoto ecosystem to, for example, replace the root of trust, to provide some evolutionary uh, insight into how the policies have been changing uh, as time goes by. You can do a greater gradual rollout of uh, Intoto into your ecosystem and then start bumping up the security uh, security of the system by uh, replacing the layout to a more stringent one. And you can also use it to identify software interdependency. You can essentially start walking through all of the supply chains and gain insight into the sources of your supply chain. This is work that, again, practical impact. We're trying to uh, come up with a, we're working with the NTIA, which is a part of the Department of Commerce. It makes sense, uh, people are consuming <laughs> Uh, paying money for software, and uh, we're trying to come up with an RFC standardization uh, process for this whole system, in total plus this. This is work that I'm doing in conjunction with uh, various teams at Google and various teams at Microsoft as well. Um, you, if, you want the, if you want the teaser, there was a talk by the CTO of uh, Azure. Uh, he made a demo of Intoto on the RSA comp last week, uh, so you may get a little bit of a taste of what it looks like. I cannot talk much about it yet. Um, I'm also looking for students to work on this. <laughs> uh, and that's it. I am two minutes short, uh, but I'm ready for questions.
this all started? Again, I was working with a tough project. Uh, I was working with Docker, not at Docker, but with Docker. Um, and they wanted to have some visibility on the process, and we actually started exploring tools out there. We found that there was nothing out there, and I was like, we need to build this. Um, I think as the project grew, it first started as something I pretty much was writing on my own. Uh, now I'm pretty much a project manager type of person. Uh, I have students that are working on such projects. I have two undergraduates working on it. I have two master's students working. Uh, at some point I have two or three high school students. I've had students over the summer and I'm pretty much um, a bridge between academic research and industry uh, interests and students that want to work on these things. Uh, right now it's the type of work that I'm doing. I, I feel pretty much like an administrator at times. So I, I really like writing code, so I go, I go home and it's like, that's my hobby now. <laughs> uh, I don't know if this answers your question. What about funding? Huh? What about funding? Funding. Uh, so 